It's clear that uh, we have a vision. Uh, with the Paris Climate Agreement, um, we have set ourselves the goals um, to limit global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees and to zero emissions um, by second half of the century. This requires us um, that, first of all, we need a commitment. We need a commitment across society, across um, the economy, at national level, as well as on the EU level, um, commitment to these goals. And this needs to be translated into short-term, medium-term, and long-term plans for action. We learned uh, about Maximizer Project's findings and recommendations for the way forward uh, with developing long-term um, plans. Uh, we heard about member states' ambitions um, and lessons learned with developing long-term strategies, also on how to involve citizens in the process. We learned about the national and sectoral specificities, talked about the importance of knowledge sharing and creating a platform for learning. Um, and uh, there was quite a bit of talk already about the implementation itself, the importance of um, having a policy framework and the right instruments to do that, the importance of monitoring progress. Um, there was discussion around the review of um, targets and policies, if we are not delivering and at what um, intervals this should happen. Um, and there was a strong message that obviously solutions technologies, a number of already exist, a number are not discussed sufficiently, and we need to ensure that we are making um, best use of available solutions and technologies in order to ensure societal, behavioral and systemic change. Um, as we go on with this um, third session, um, just like to say that um, I think it will be interesting to continue building on what we were discussing in the first two sessions to really understand um, what could be done differently. How can we improve the development and implementation of these long-term plans? Um, but then really understand and uh, look at the um, look at these questions also from the global context. Why do Europe's actions matter um, in a global context? Uh, why do we need to actually take this challenge seriously? And um, it's worth to keep in mind as while we're talking about um, the long-term um, plans here, we do have, we heard in the first um, two sessions, this is a very complex exercise that uh, we have ongoing. And uh, we have on one level, we have the European and the EU's own uh, mid-century um, plan, which is in the process. Um, development. We hope that we'll be touching upon that. Uh, we have the shorter term um, national plans um, for climate and energy, and then we have the link with the long term plans. So this is a very complex exercise, and uh, we look forward to touching upon some of these um, challenges on bringing it all together and uh, making these um, strategies deliver as we uh, move on to this session. Um, as our First speaker, um, we have uh, Thomas Khrushchev, um, special envoy for climate change and high level um, and high level climate champion from Ministry of Environment Poland. As the preparations uh, for the next um, COP are ongoing, it's uh, very interesting to hear from you how you see the importance of um, the development and implementation of long term strategies, and how do you see um, in the next um, COP? what will be done to push these um, forward and uh, what perhaps uh, could be a role for the EU and EU member states in um, helping um, to take the long-term planning um, on the next level. Thank you. You are the boss here. Um, <laughs> in that case, um, I'll be happy to if we, uh, each of you wishes to make a presentation from here and then we can move on to the panel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's, it's, it's really good to be here with so many friends. Um, well, you've, you've asked a few questions that I doubt very much if I can answer. I, 
I'm completely not sure what would be the potential set of decisions uh, from from the COP. It's in the hands of 197 parties to the to the agreement, to the convention, and um, well, there is a certain level of unpredictability in this decision making process. So we can think what we want to have. We can argue that what we want to have is important. And of course, uh, the EU will certainly be one of those who will push for as good as possible solutions. But it's always a number of, of unknowns that usually appear in the very last minute. And um, this very last minute is usually extremely interesting time. Uh, but what let's 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 come back to to the topic. I, I really like the, the the way you formulated the topic: secret solutions. Well, secret solutions that well suggests that we have kind of a silver bullet, um, very well prepared hidden rule book in the back pocket. We don't. Uh, we don't have uh, neither of those, but uh, we hope that um, without silver bullet and without holding anything in the back pocket, we can uh, deliver the result that is that is needed. And what is the kind of result that we need? I, I think that we have to come back a little bit to the basics, what Paris Agreement is telling us. Well, first of all, it tells us that um, we can only succeed to curb the warming if we take into account all components of climate system, all four components as they are described in the Climate Change Convention, the biosphere, the geosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere. All these components interact. All these components are very important for maintaining overall balance of, of what is happening around us in the nature, in the natural world. So, so that, that's, that, that, that's very important. We also need to keep in mind that for the vast majority of the countries of the world, it is not a discussion about climate change. Yes, they keep repeating climate change is, 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 is our deadly threat. They keep repeating climate change is the biggest challenge and nobody can really deny that. But for them, the overriding priority is eradication of poverty. For them, the overriding priority is making sure that these countries will be developing in an equitable manner so they will be advancing on their way to firstly promote upgrade from the least developed country level and eventually they will reach the level of development that would ensure decent life standards for all. And let's not forget that in the developing world, one of the pressures that the governments there and also the governments here have to take into account is demographic pressure and 75 new citizens of the planet every year makes 1.5 billion in 20 years. That's, by the way, means mid 2040s, 9 billion people at least. Um, and half of the growth in Africa. And Africa is our neighbor. Paris Agreement made the contributions that every country is bringing to the global goal a sovereign decision. So we have to respect the sovereign right of each country to make their sovereign resolution to decide upon priorities, about, upon timing, upon pathways they would be choosing to reach their, again, development goals. 
if they start planning adaptation, for instance, they are in fact planning the foundation for the future investments. Because adaptation is, of course, the immediate response to the threats, it's immediate response to some uh, risks, but long term, it's the way to alleviate the risks for investors equally as it's alleviation of the risks, the threats to human lives and to losses of property. And um, let's not forget, many people say, well, what are, what are the goals of Paris Agreement? Well, it's temperature goal, it's adaptation goal, it's uh, financial goal. Yes, but ultimate goal is climate neutrality. The ultimate goal is that by the second half of the century, we can transform our economies. And when I say our economies, I mean all the economies globally to make them carbon neutral. Some call it zero net emissions, some call it different way. But the point is that, well, some emissions will stay with us. Some emissions are even needed because that these emissions are associated with manufacturing of certain goods that help us to address the issues of climate change, the issues of energy efficiency, et cetera, et cetera. We have to balance them. How to do it? Well, Paris Agreement tells us how to do it. We have to balance it with the things, with enhanced capacity of biosystem to absorb carbon dioxide from atmosphere and maintain it in, in the wood, in the soil, in biosystem in general. Globally, we can see different kinds of forests, we can see different crops, but the mechanism is the same. Carbon is captured from atmosphere and kept in biosystem. So, as a matter of fact, the key question here is how we make this sustainable transition in a way that is truly sustainable. Because we say, yeah, we, will have, we are having the 17 sustainable development goals, out of which the goal number 13 is climate action, which is described by Paris Agreement. So we know how to do it. Well, yes and no. We think we know how to do it. What is good message? The good news is that there is no longer debate whether the sustainability agenda should be separated from climate agenda. This is the same development trans agenda for sustainable transition of the world. What is the role of the EU? Well, probably each of us would, would have its own definition, hers or his own definition, but we can probably agree that this role is very important. Uh, it's very important because it is about us. So we want ourselves to be perceived as, as those who are contributing with some important um, actions, important uh, supports, et cetera, et cetera, important ideas. But it is also perceived by international community as very important uh, for many reasons, for a variety of reasons. It looks like the EU is um, the only block of developed countries that is doing what it is. The EU is saying. So we say and we do. Sometimes we first do and then we call it and then we say, but there is no, let's say, double message. And uh, when we say, it means that we have legal solutions in place that help to demonstrate that what we are saying is real that it has a real basis in our legal system. Why I'm saying that? Because I strongly believe that we do much more than anybody else in the world. And uh, I believe that we can 
easily prove it. And uh, we are probably the only group of countries that institutionalized adaptation. We are probably the group of countries that contributes more than so-called fair share in development assistance and climate finance. But we are still in a defensive from time to time. We are still trying to uh, explain why we are not doing more. Well, we, we are doing a lot already. So let's be proud of it and let's, let's not shy away from communicating it to the world that, that the EU is, is really the lead, is a real leader. And uh, from my conversations with colleagues from all over the world, including those groups that are perceived as the most difficult, it's very clear that it is appreciated. So when they complain that developed countries are not doing this or that, they very rarely include the EU in this equation, in this complaint. Well, let, let's, let's stop for a while on how the post-Paris world looks like. Um, yeah, of course, it, nothing has changed. We are still traveling around the sun. So Paris Agreement did not change that. Um, what happened is that Paris Agreement is very clear about indicating how the group of countries like the EU could, demon could transform ourselves and at the same time demonstrated to the world. So we can better prepare ourselves for facing the challenges of the future through building internal resilience into economy, into infrastructure, in natural protection, uh, to address water shortages, etc., etc. But we also need to build our external resilience. Our external resilience to face the competition, economic competition, to face the competition in accessing resources. That's why circular economy is so important. And also to face demographic pressures of external world. So these are the challenges. These are real challenges of the next 20, 30 years that we can and we must address using the solutions that are prescribed also in Paris Agreement. Not solely, but also in Paris Agreement. So Paris Agreement is, is very good in, in, in suggesting solutions. Well, we have our discussion about how to prepare the long-term low emission, low carbon development strategy. A uh, very important discussion that uh, included many member states, many stakeholders organizations that gave some kind of ideas, what is the expectation of the member states on the process to formulate this strategy, to develop this strategy. And of course, uh, no, no, nobody questions the, the, this, this strategic goal of achieving carbon neutrality by mid-century, but how we can do it? Can we continue with the current approach that we will have the EU ETS and non-ETS part? Or we need to look at Paris Agreement and try to think, okay, maybe for some countries, the pathways would be different. So we have to end up in, let's say 2050, 2060, whatever would be the, 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 the decision of the political uh, masters of, of the EU member states. But we need to approach all these goals doing what we can do best. So if there is a country that has already developed renewable energy sources, 
let them continue and let them add to this. If there is a country that, like my country, that has still pretty high level of carbonization of power system, well, we, we cannot change it from Monday to Tuesday. We will be, we are, and we are doing it. We are proving that it's changing. But we have fantastic potential of forests. We have very good agriculture, so we can help with things. We can help with offering the rest of the Europe the potential for absorption of, of carbon from atmosphere. So I think that we, we need to start thinking of new approach to this very high, very ambitious goals of mid-century in a way that it would make a best use of what of all the assets the member states are having. The best use of the assets instead of pushing for the solutions that might be costly. And of course, amongst these assets is this among these assets is sustainable land management. Sustainable land management that includes forestry, that includes agriculture, that includes spatial planning. And we are very good in it. We could be the kind of hub of excellence for the world to demonstrate how to do it and to demonstrate how to benefit, how to create jobs, how to create food security, how to make sure that thanks to this in fact, very simple <coughs> measures, we can improve air quality, water quality, and long-term fertility of soils. So we have a lot to offer, and this is conclusion of my message, as the EU to the world. We can offer to the world our expertise. We can offer to the world our policies that are almost ready for implementation. Everybody would need to adjust, to adapt this policy to the needs of the country. But certain solutions in circular economy, sustainable land management, jobs creation, just transition of workforce. Many countries went through this process. Some are still going through this process where we had to, to face out certain industries and offer the, the, the people who lost their jobs something new. This is what the EU can not only do internally, but that could be our offer to the external world. This is our offer to build capacity elsewhere. And last but not least, finance. Um, countries cannot change unless they have sustainable system of financing the development investments. These kind of systems have been created in the EU. These systems are based on very simple, very simple rule, very simple rules. Polluter pays rule of solidarity and the rule of equitable development. And this is what the world is expecting from the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Um, it's, it's great to hear about the global context and uh, see where the discussions are going. And I'm sure there will be a number of uh, issues um, in the Q questions and answers session and that we'll be happy to pick on. Uh, for the sake of time, and um, we will not take uh, questions now, um, but we will rather take them after all the presentations. As our next uh, speaker, we have uh, Richard Barron, uh, Executive Director for 2050 Pathways Platform. It would be interesting to hear also um, some of your takeaways uh, from the morning session and uh, how you see uh, the role of the long-term strategies um, in achieving the um, long-term goals for, uh, under the Paris Climate Agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Annika. If I could get the uh, the clicker, thanks a lot. Um, thank you um, 
to the organizers for uh, having invited the uh, 2050 Pathways platform to speak today. If I may, like uh, Thomas, I'd like to pick on the, on the title of the session, which was about uh, secret solutions. Um, I think as will be clear from my remarks, I think long-term strategies have to you know, step outside of what might have been a few years back, the poor cousin of climate policy. You focus very much on NDCs, on near-term pledges, to uh, come to the front and come to the front in more than one way. Sorry about that. Uh, is that right, this one? No. Ah, here we go, got it. Um, so, as I said, no secret solutions in long-term strategies. I think they have to step out, be in the forefront. And by being no secret, I also mean by being as inclusive and participatory as possible. Not a piece of paper that's put on the table to unlock, but to actually a piece of paper that results from a, a broad-ranging uh, process to, to decide on a strategy that is uh, uh, owned by the public and by the, the um, political parties as well. A word on the 2050 Pathways platform. We were uh, created by Laurence Tubiana, who's one of the architects of COP21 and the Paris Agreement. We have 26 countries now, a number of cities and regions, and among the 26 countries, 21 have either completed their long-term strategies or are on the way of completing them. So quite encouraged by that and by the ambition that's there. Now, I was asked to speak about the role of long-term strategies in moving towards 1.5 degrees. So let me maybe move this out of the way. We had a bit of a discussion about that this morning. I'm not going to solve this for you, but I'd like to maybe cite from one uh, Nature article that basically says, our analysis suggests that pursuing efforts to limit temperature increase to 1.5, which is the Paris Agreement wording, is not chasing a geophys uh, geophysical impossibility. Double negative there. It says it's feasible, geophysically feasible. So let's keep that there. Now, from other IPCC work, the message is very clear. Overall, we need to get to net global CO2 by 2050 at the latest and net uh, greenhouse gas zero emissions uh, shortly thereafter. If you consider EU's past responsibility on EU emissions, if you consider its level of economic development, if you consider its level of technology access and advancement, we surely expect to see a scenario reaching net zero greenhouse gases by 2050 at the latest. Now, we recognize, I think here, that all member states are not equally endowed to get there. Uh, the reliance on land use, for instance, I think is something that's gonna be highly differentiated across countries inside the EU. But in order to determine what's feasible and fair, we will need to have a full assessment country by country about the mitigation potentials that are there, including land use. And I think this is why national long-term strategies are particularly critical so that all can bring to the fore what they have to offer to this, to this common goal um, at the EU level and more globally. Now, here's a, a simple schematic to illustrate our approach in the 2050 Pathways platform. The idea is to actually you know, look at the usual um, uh, picture, which is a business as usual trend that's highly unsustainable. We have the NDC trend that seems to be going in the right direction, but not, not nearly as fast as we wished. Our approach is to say the Article 4.1 sets the goal, emissions neutrality in the second half of the century. In the case of the EU, let's look at 2050 and look at what it would mean to have that picture then and backcast our emissions back to the present. Um, the idea is to make sure that the near-term policies are going to be in full coherence with that. It might be more difficult for some and others to get there, but at the end of the day, the long-term low carbon pathway will be there to elucidate how we can adjust the NDCs because different policy measures will have to be taken to, to get there. Now, we do hear from our members that when they have started doing this, they immediately have started reconsidering their NDCs. This is not just a picture, this is something that's happening on the ground in more, uh, our, our countries. Now, it's also the, the fact that we, we would be looking at this from a net zero emissions is also something that's important from the investment community standpoint. We hear repeatedly from uh, sustainable investors in particular that they need an end goal, that they need a clear sense of direction. I think having a, a strategy that actually reflects how the EU and other countries might be going there is really important for them. We also hear from development banks uh, from the Agence Française de Développement, from the Inter-American Development Bank, that they want their client countries to be empowered 
and being able to say, this is acceptable, this is Paris compatible, and this isn't. I think in the case of the EU, it's probably going to be the same. Some technology options might be okay for certain countries for some time and not for other countries for, from now on. We need to have a clear sense of what options are on the table and what options are off the table by when and where. And I think the long-term strategies might be there to precisely answer those questions. And I think this partly echoes what uh, Thomas Khrushchev was, was pointing out earlier in terms of uh, differences across countries. So this is a simple picture. Um, this is the more complicated picture and largely another way to look at the elements that the maximizer process came out with on how we should build those robust pathways. We have a range of stakeholders, they're not all detailed here. We had a head of government from which we would hope there would be a sense that the long-term strategy is needed for the country and launch a process to get there. We have a range of stakeholders, civil societies, industries, NGOs and the like who are going to be coming in and providing advice throughout. We have the research community that has started this whole process more than 30 years ago, remember, and that is now ready to actually produce some of the numbers uh, for others to look at and to question and to uh, eventually agree to on long-term strategies and policymakers that have to turn this into, into a reality. Maybe one element that we'd like to point out here is um, that this is not strictly just about climate goals. We would like as much as possible for these projections to reflect and identify the important socioeconomic objective that e the EU, the country has for itself. Because a climate change projection that is so transformational, that implies so many policy revisions and reforms has to speak to the other uh, important goals that the country has for itself. I think this is part of creating the vision there will be a tendency early on when producing scenarios to focus on the numbers, to focus on energy, CO2 emissions and land use, and on climate, strictly speaking. I think it's also important to speak to the issues about the financial situation of the country, the growth situation, the innovation situation, employment, education, and the like, because they all come into play or have some intersection with the long-term strategies. So all these are important elements in creating this vision. Mm -hmm. Now, turning quickly as to how we, we see long-term strategies moving from being constraints to being vision. I think it's important to keep in mind from now on, and it's part of the narrative, that we need a clear long-term objective. This is the balance uh, between sources and sinks in the Paris Agreement. I think using more uh, frequently the term zero emissions as a direction of travel, including to speak to the general public, zero emissions is where, what we're going for, is, would be an important uh, first step. I think the long-term strategies with the processes just described are there and should be there to reveal the tough trade-offs and vulnerabilities, because that's only through this that we're going to be able to plan ahead some of the major employment, but also the communities transitions, which we could do over two to three decades. There is time to do this, but we need to identify them early and not let the situations rot. This is also, of course, a way to minimize stranding or lock-in, but mind you, we clearly understand that we move, when we move from the NDCs to the more ambitious long-term strategies, that there will be more and faster stranding happening. But we want to make sure that this is going to be as orderly as possible. It's also, and we heard about this earlier this morning with uh, Sweden, a way to unlock uh, business ima imagination. We're very much, or maybe we're at a stage where the discussion around reducing emissions in industry or in business has been energy efficiency, and renewable energy supply. I think we're moving more towards a, a sense that materials efficiency is important. And I think talking about zero emissions is one way to unlock the, that sort of discussion. The roadmaps are gonna be useful. I, I look forward to seeing the roadmaps from Sweden, but other countries like Norway being shared more widely uh, inside the EU. And then there has to be a discussion about what policy tools are needed. The, Sweden uh, roadmaps, as I understand them, are voluntary. They've been put together by industry on the table for the government to consider. And now the question is, what policies does the government put in front of it? Is it public procurement? Is it specific innovation tools to make those actually happen? And I think that discussion has to take place. Uh, there has to be a market shift, and the government sometimes holds the key to that market shift. We also need to identify common challenges and innovation priorities. In almost all the discussions we had with our countries, they said agriculture and industry are the tough ones. So it's interesting to look at where we would need them to be to be able to reach zero. 
and then ask back what is the innovation processes and priorities to get there. And I think having a, a broad-based exercise across countries is going to be able to socialize that knowledge and realize the challenge more effectively. And then we need to unpack uh, some of the long-term drivers of emissions and identify the room for maneuver. I think the collective reliance on land use is definitely one. I think one that's largely not addressed so far, but I think the 1.5 report from the IPCC is going to do a bit in this direction, is to look at the projected and the possible lifestyle changes and what they might deliver. And last but not least, and for those of you in the back where the chairs might be hiding the last lines, I want to stress this one. We need also need to build on the regions, on the cities, on the businesses, positive climate actions. These players have been extremely apt at finding out the key co-benefits, the ways to unlock their actions, be it health or access to employment when it comes to cities, resource efficiency or license to operate for companies. And they also have the ability to shift markets at the local level. Again, green procurement can be useful there. So look at what they're providing because they're supporting domestic action at their level and need to be encouraged and also need a signal from long-term trajectories to continue operating. So let me finish with some views on, on the EU. I guess at this stage, much has been said about this, but not by everyone. This is my take. So on the, uh, on the decision by the council, very much welcome to see that there is a push towards that. Uh, we hope that it will reflect uh, on the well below 2 and 1.5 and aim for zero emissions on, on a greenhouse gas basis, uh, that it will take stock of the IPCC 1.5 report, not only on the sense of urgency, but also on where the report says there are clear innovation gaps uh, or mitigation gaps that we need to investigate further. Also, I think it's absolutely critical at this stage, at this time, that the long-term strategy on climate becomes part of a broader positive vision for Europe. For that, it has to be as inclusive as possible. I think the net zero emissions strategies need to be elaborated by the member states and, and produce some kind of guidance uh, to the uh, Commission as well. And also to be able to identify where solidarity might be needed across countries when it comes to getting to net zero. We heard about land use uh, just earlier. On the governance regulation, not much to add there from what was said, but translating the long-term strategies in more concrete near-term action would be, of course, most welcome. And then we have to recognize the magnitude of the necessary structural changes because they also imply a lot of policy reforms around other policy levers that might exist uh, to achieve this, but also indicate that the EU should support other countries in establishing their own long-term strategies so that we speak with one, one voice. So in summary, the platform really welcomes Europe's effort to produce a very ambitious long-term strategy. And we strongly encourage the Commission to put forward uh, by 20, a, a cohesive scenario that will be the start of that discussion uh, on net zero emissions by 2050 at the latest. We also think it should be cast in this broader vision for Europe where climate uh, comes as a lever for prosperity, a lever for peace and fairness inside as well as outside Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that's something that I'll pick on. It provides a nice bridge also to, the, um, to our next speaker and hopefully also to the Q&A, but it's this backcasting um, of emissions. And when we're talking about the EU's own uh, strategy, we're looking into hearing hopefully a bit more on that. Um, and then also with the link with the national long-term strategies, it would be interesting to understand um, in these what is the possibilities of doing this back casting of emissions and start from there. Um, and uh, perhaps in the Q&A, we'll be able to go a bit more on that um, to understand where we are and uh, kind of also the measures needed if we really are to take this seriously. Um, as our next speaker, we have uh, Mauro Petrizione, Director General from DG Clima from the European Commission. Um, we're delighted to have you join us. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for this invitation. And uh, when, you're, when the speaker before you starts by telling you that everybody, everything has been said already, you're not in trouble. But I'm kind of used to trouble, so I'll give it a try myself and see whether I... Well, I don't think I'm going to tell you anything new, but let's see whether I can 
say things in a slightly different fashion and therefore contribute uh, to the debate. Uh, and let me start with the, uh, with the strategy. Uh, I also want to add a little word on something that uh, Thomas dealt with, you know, how we handle uh, our relation with other countries. But let's start about our own business in Europe. Uh, in 2011, as you know, we had a roadmap uh, to 2050, which had as a basic scenario, 80% reduction in emission by 2050. Uh, it's obsolete. Some of the guesses we made, uh, notably on technological developments, um, have been quite different. We were banking heavily on technologies for carbon capture and storage and use, and that's lagging. Uh, we had not expected the development we saw for renewables, for instance. At the same time, that roadmap did play a very fundamental role in informing policy, in informing policy choices. It all went in the right direction. And without those policy choices, we wouldn't be able to formulate a better long-term strategy now. So this is to say, this is a long-term strategy. We're looking at 2050. We're not looking at the next legislative program. This commission is not going to put forward targets or legislative programs. We are going to set an objective. We're going to set a goal. We're going to set milestones without which that goal cannot be reached. Uh, but the legislative process, the instruments will have to come later and may have an influence on uh, changing that, uh, uh, that goal itself, as we have seen now. I'm not in a position to tell you today what the goal would be, would be announced when the commission vision of this strategy will come out. Uh, we are now working on models, we are working on alternative scenarios. Clearly, we're going to have another look at the 80% scenario. Is it going to be enough or we shall see? Clearly, the net zero emissions by 2050 is on the table. Is it doable? Okay. There's plenty of studies out there, but this is not about yet another study. This is about a political institution taking a political responsibility to propose to the European Union that this should be the union strategy. So we'll see. Uh, my commission has already stuck his neck out on this issue. And I personally think he's right we will have a clear statement of what the commission thinks is possible, is desirable, sooner rather than later. The council has asked us to produce this strategy in the first quarter of 2019. We intend to come up with the commission vision by the end of November. I'll come back to the reason for that in a minute. And the president will certainly want to say something in the State of the Union uh, after the summer. So, what is it going to look like if it's not about legislation, if it's not about targets? Uh, and again, it's about completing the energy transition. It's about, well, Richard, you said those are the tough ones, but those are also the essential ones. It's about looking at industry, it's about looking at land. It's about looking at how we run our economy, it's about how we run our society how we want our economy and our society to change. Uh, so it's about seeing, can we trigger a real industrial transformation? There are signs, perhaps more than signs that that is happening. Um, can it be done economy-wide? Can it be done in Europe with the diversity that we still have of economic structure uh, in Europe? Uh, can it be done as an example uh, for other countries in the world? Again, I come back to the question of the example. Land is an area which has been kind of neglected. The technology, so to speak, is not there. Sure, but short of very radical uh, changes in consumption pattern, um, we're not going to uh, address the um, land issue with current policies. So land needs a hard look at how we administer it. I've lived through several reforms of the common agricultural policy. In 30 years, we have a very different agricultural policy 
than we had before. So it can be changed if we know how we want to change, if we know where we want to go, uh, and if we want to do it. Um, but I think it's fair to say that we don't know enough today about how we want to change uh, our agriculture in the next 30 years. So that is going to be a very important part of what the Commission is going to put on the table. Um, again, this is not about triggering the next CAP reform. It's about setting the objectives for the next CAP reform and the one after that. Much has been said about a number of other issues which are also crucial to the strategy, the circular economy. Uh, I haven't heard uh, a mention of mobility, transport. We know that both maritime and aviation are an issue in terms of, uh, of emission. The whole nexus between urbanization, energy efficiency, uh, patterns of mobility, but all these are horizontal strands that cut across all these three pillars uh, of our economy, energy, industry, and land. And the strategy has to put forward a vision on all of them and how they interact. Uh, more important, I think both Thomas and Richard have already made that point, but let me stress it. Our governments do not have a mandate to uh, arrive at zero emission by neglecting the rest of the policies. The only way a climate policy is legitimate is a climate policy that also makes our economy competitive, that preserves and creates jobs, that keeps our society running in the way we want our society to run. And here I come to the international aspect. You know, I'm a relatively newcomer to this, uh, to this field. And one of the mantras that I have found arriving is the union has to give the example. Europe has to lead by example. Well, leading also means having followers. An American politician said, if you're a leader and nobody's following you, you're not a leader. You're a guy out on a, on a walk. Uh, the only way we're going to persuade major economies in the world is to show that the climate transformation that we have in mind is also more successful economically than their existing economic model. It's the only way you're going to bring, back, bring the U.S. back to the table. It's the only way you're going to bring China really onto the table. China today uh, talks a good talk. The pressure on them, the constraints on them to walk the walk are enormous, and I think to a level that even we in Europe can't imagine. It's only by showing them that they can become a developed, clean economy that we can persuade them to follow us. Um, what else? Uh, the last thing I would like to say on the international aspect, uh, apart from the example, apart from the success, which will not, uh, um, which will take time, to appear. One thing that I'm convinced we have to do is to bring back the political attention on to the issue of climate and the Paris Agreement. I think it's quite clear that Paris happened because heads of state and government uh, came to the realization that this was about the survival of the country. In many cases, the survival of the country as they know it some cases, the survival of the country to cool. I think now the process is in, in a, back in our hands, in the hands of the officials. And there's a very real danger that it runs into the sand again. So I think it's crucial that we uh, revive the direct attention of leaders to this issue in the run up to Katowice not forgetting that important as the goals that we have in Katowice this year are, they are all process goals. They're about transparency, they're about common metrics, they're about uh, 
how we measure finance, uh, they are not yet about substance. Substance will come next in 2020, when we have to present our long-term strategies. Um, so, if we can't get it right this year in Katowice on process, I think that doesn't bode well for getting it right on substance in uh, two and a half years' time. Lastly, um, I should perhaps start with that, but that's never too late. Uh, process on a strategy, what's going to happen in practice. I'm sure plenty of people will be interested. Uh, we will start a public consultation in June. You're all familiar with the way the Commission does public consultation. There'll be a questionnaire. That it will run for the customary three months. Uh, we will also intersperse the consultation with some public events, one of which in Brussels in 10th and 11th of July, uh, to draw more attention, to draw more participation, uh, to help those who are most active uh, to do contributions that are also informed by uh, more debate, specifically on the issue that we are looking at. Uh, in, in drafting this strategy. Um, we will come to some preliminary conclusions uh, after the summer, hopefully to enable us to at least be clearer on what are our preferred scenarios and what our targets are. Um, it won't be a complete work. The complete work will appear at the end of November. In time, for us to showcase it in Katowice, in time to show to the world that we are actually, as uh, uh, Thomas very aptly put it earlier, we actually do, as we say. Um, lastly, this is not the EU strategy yet. This is the commission vision of it. There's gonna be a debate. It's gonna be a long debate. Uh, it's going to be a debate in difficult conditions because one of the major actors will be kind of hampered. Uh, come early spring 2019, the parliament is in electoral campaign. And it's going to be a difficult year for the parliament. Uh, we have a difficult political situation if you just look at the result of elections in many of our countries. It will be reflected in the European parliament. There will be, as soon as the parliament has settled down, uh, a new president of the commission, a new college, the hearings. We risk a situation where uh, this strategy is only debated in the council for about 12 months. It's a very good thing. We do need to have a very thorough debate with member states. And I recall that this strategy is meant to take into account member states' national energy and climate plans. But it is not healthy uh, to have a debate that takes place only in the council. Uh, so we need to keep the debate open throughout 2019. Uh, civil society will have a key role to play in that respect. And the, you, I think you can expect the conclusion of that debate and the union view on this strategy sometime in early 2020. So crossing our fingers, will be in time uh, to go back to the UNF uh, C and present our view in 2020. Uh, but it's going to be a, a long, difficult, but certainly interesting world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that really help to clarify, I think that's uh, already questions that we're picking up in the, in the audience on the process, et cetera. So thank you very much for pro providing that outline. Um, we'll be happy to come back um, to some of the issues raised, but as our last uh, speaker, as a respondent, we have Constance Khan, a director uh, for institutional relations and public affairs at the European Investment Bank. We, when we did the poll, um, we saw that uh, 
one of the uh, findings was that the national plans were considered especially important for investors. And we've heard about the importance of investment also in the course uh, in the morning and the importance of financial systems um, also in the session today. So it would be very interesting to hear your thoughts on what you have heard. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, kind invitation to be uh, to be here. And indeed, I was just in time to see the results of the poll and saw the box of the investors, you know, growing and growing. Um, uh, also, when I yeah, received your invitations, uh, I yeah, was very pleased to see that you asked us to participate in the panel on solutions. We always like, you know, to uh, to, to be there. Uh, and like Thomas, I was struggling a little bit with the secrecy. I thought, hmm, indeed, silver bullet, secret weapon. Uh, and then, you know, thought about the general concern that you always hear, uh, namely that uh, we all feel that the EU uh, is going in the right direction, uh, but not, you know, with the uh, the, the right uh, pace. So therefore, I thought that the yeah, the issue of finding common solutions and doing things together, which I think I also heard this morning, uh, because I was able to come in very quickly, you know, in the morning session. That's the benefit of living in the in the same house here, uh, and. Uh, so again, I think this is all very much about, uh, about partnering. Um, the, uh, indeed, the reference this morning also by the, uh, by the Commission for the need for massive investments if we want to deliver on a long-term strategy to reduce greenhouse gases uh, and arrive at a low carbon and competitive European economy uh, did not get lost uh, on, uh, on me. I think also the, the Paris Agreement, as you all know, uh, recognizes the central role of, uh, of climate finance, uh, be it public or private, and really asks for aligning of all the financial flows uh, with a low carbon and climate resilient uh, future. Uh, also this morning, I picked up on the comment on supporting innovation to meet the, uh, the climate target, and specifically the need for uh, system innovation, including the, uh, the financial uh, system, uh, so, uh, therefore, I, I feel that we as the EIB, the European Investment Bank, you know, have something uh, really to, to contribute here to, uh, to today's discussion, because these are exactly the priority areas in which we, uh, we work uh, and where we can, you know, contribute as the, uh, the financial arm uh, of the uh, EU, uh, the so-called EU bank uh, that uh, implements the, uh, the EU policies, priorities and, uh, and standards. Uh, and we do that by delivering some 20 billion of financing for climate action every year. To say that uh, it is actually the only area in which the EIB has a specific target uh, to, uh, to, to deliver. Namely, 25% of our annual lending in the EU uh, has to be on climate action, and that is very stringently defined. Some 35% of our lending outside the EU is for climate action. Uh, and in the prolongation of FC, so this is the financing part of the investment plan for Europe, it was actually agreed to insert a target of 40% for, yeah, for, for climate action. So you can see that this is you know, very much on our radar screen and it's true. Uh, if you have a target, uh, you measure and you do. Um, I was also uh, pleased to, uh, to see some of the, the conclusions uh, and key points of the, of the Maximizer project uh, this morning. Uh, and uh, there you rightly point out uh, to the importance of the EU emissions trading system and the energy union governance uh, regulation. Uh, but I think it is also equally important to influence and uh, uh, challenge perhaps the work that is uh, also being done on sustainable uh, finance by the Commission uh, within the uh, within the capital markets uh, union, and we are pleased, you know, to partner there with the Commission as uh, and working, you know, with them, uh, not only in the uh, the high level group, uh, but now also in implementing some of the uh, the actions that uh, that were agreed. But we also know that uh, public funding for uh, climate action uh, will not be enough, so we have to be smart uh, on how we mobilize private uh, capital. And I think you know, here the opportunities in the, the next multi-annual financial framework, uh, the post-2020 framework, uh, and therein again, the, uh, the possibility for financial instruments uh, and blended finance opportunities will be, uh, will be quite uh, important. 
this is on the lending side uh, as uh, for, for projects. I also believe it is important to look to the other side of the coin, uh, namely the, the funding uh, instruments such as the, the, the green bonds, which I'm very pleased to say the EIB pioneered, you know, back in, in, uh, in 2007, uh, which is now being utilized by uh, many governments, corporate actors uh, across the, uh, the world, uh, where again, you know, the work within the Capital Markets Union uh, will, you know, further uh, strengthen this. Our green bonds are focused on uh, renewable energy and energy uh, efficiency, uh, but I am pleased to, uh, to let you know that we will later this year uh, launch our first sustainab sustainability awareness bonds, uh, in which we in the first phase will focus on, on water. And that comes back you know, to the comments that were made uh, before as climate you know, being part of that uh, overall SDG uh, strategy. And we indeed, we, we fully concur. Uh, with uh, aiming for compatibility between the, the, the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. And we think that we should indeed explicitly pursue synergies between climate objectives and, uh, and other uh, SDG uh, goals. Just to maybe to give you an example, uh, with the EIB, we may be latecomers on gender uh, strategy, but we did make sure that we could therefore also leap uh, uh, forward um, we, yeah, we agreed uh, not only a gender strategy, but also an action plan. And we really feel that uh, women economic empowerment can be an enabler, you know, to deliver on the other SDGs, uh, including, uh, including climate. So to come back to the question, you know, that was raised with me. So how, you know, does the EIB make sure that we build a portfolio of projects? that are compatible with the, uh, with the Paris Agreement and support countries meeting their NDCs. I already mentioned that we are the policy implementing bank, so we always follow the lead uh, of the, yeah, the Commission of the Union on, on policies and, and measures, and we translate that in our eligibility criteria for projects and for our sector lending uh, policies. Uh, but let me give you some other, you know, four short uh, examples. Um, Outside the EU, and it was often mentioned that also the outside the EU dimension uh, is, uh, is important, uh, there we do support the Mediterranean countries in the design of their nationally appropriate mitigation uh, actions. Um, we saw also on the slides of the, yeah, the pathway platforms the importance of the, the local actors, and I would really fully second that, uh, because if we are going to arrive at meeting this, uh, this goal, uh, it will uh, require, you know, all of us, and particularly also the local actors, uh, to to be engaged. So we are doing a lot of work uh, with the uh, with the cities uh, to look into, you know, how uh, they uh, can uh, develop as uh, smart and sustainable uh, cities, uh, and we develop specific financial instruments uh, for that. But we're also looking into uh, advisory services in order to make sure that the capacity is there as well at the cities to deliver these uh, programs. This is this, you know, uh, EU's Orbis program uh, on which we are partnering with the, uh, with the Commission. But we're also making sure that when we launch, you know, Pacts of Amsterdam, that there is attention for the follow-up and for the delivery and execution. Uh, so we are, you know, working in some work streams uh, there. We work with the Global Confidant of Mayors, uh, UN Habitat, so and I, I must say, I am really quite impressed uh, with, the, uh, with the actions from the, yeah, from the cities. We're also uh, doing more on, on our advisory. Uh, again, we heard before about the importance of business in, you know, imagination. Uh, yes, uh, ideas are, are really good, but it will be even better you know, if we can translate those ideas into bankable projects. Uh, so that's you know why we're beefing uh, up uh, that part uh, of the uh, of the EIB, and we are um, you know looking to uh, uh, take a more strategic approach to our pipeline uh, development. We are clearly demand driven, uh, but we are doing work on market gaps and market analyses. So to understand you know better you know where our financing can make a, a real impact, and to uh, to to close off my yeah, my contribution. Uh, again, you know, coming back to uh, to innovation, we really believe that that is an important uh, enabler as well uh, to uh, to meeting the uh, the goals. Uh, and there, we see it as the role for the EIB to really, you know, go for you know that type of innovation 
and where we can support new frontier technologies. And I can tell you that 10 years ago, wind and solar uh, created lots of debates in the board meetings of the EIB as to whether it was cost competitive, et cetera. I think we have now been able to demonstrate that it is uh, that we can actually take a competitive advantage also on, on a global uh, stage. But we need to make sure that our financing moves to the next frontier. Uh, for example, uh, what we can do on new technologies like floating wind farms, where we can capture both you know, wave and uh, wind energy, uh, and also do more on, uh, on storage uh, technologies. I would like to leave it at that and happy to, uh, to provide further comments. So we have a chance to have a um, bit of, um, uh, we have uh, around half an hour, so actually 20 minutes for a QA. and a um, Be happy to take questions from the floor, um, comments if you have any. While you're thinking, I'll actually, then I'll start off myself. Um, first of all, it was great to hear, um, and we've heard um, the role of cities being mentioned a number of times. I'd like to just um, put that um, to you, that do, how do you see, when we're thinking of the long-term strategies, and this obviously is a question also for member states, we heard um, from um, Germany about their very participatory um, consultation process. Um, but this is obviously a challenge when long-term strategies are being developed. We have um, a number of cities that are very forward-looking and are very ambitious with what is being done. How do we ensure um, that these kind of long-term strategies ensure that this kind of forward-looking thinking is uh, incorporated in there? Um, and then we have been talking um, um, quite a bit also about negative emissions. And I would just like to hear thoughts um, in the panel on how do you see, uh, what are the prospects um, for um, actually going to negative emissions? And what do you see as being the main solutions and that we should be looking at um, at the moment? Um, looking if there are any additional questions. Yes, um, there's a mic. Uh, Annika, thank you. Mark Johnston, I'm still thinking about everything that Mauro said, um, but I don't have a question yet, but I'm, I'm kind of putting a, putting, putting a little flag there in case there's time later on. Um, but until that moment in time, um, uh, Constance, um, you, you said um, the bank follows the institutions. That's fairly well known. Um, are there any examples uh, you can point to where you think the institutions may have got it wrong? So that's the general question and, and leading on a bit more specific to that. Um, has the last 10, 15 years of, uh, you, you said as well, you look taking a fresh look at pipelines. Has the last 10 to 15 years of gas expansion and gas diversification, uh, including the point that we got all the forecasts wrong, um, does that situation point to uh, a, a failure of what we've done on gas and gas diversification, gas expansion? Um, not least, for example, because the tiny volumes that will start to come down the southern corridor this summer um, are, don't replace what we've lost on domestic production in the Netherlands, for example. Uh, and we still see, you know, we, uh, Gazprom's market share is increasing and Gazprom's capital spend goes on. So, uh, uh, you know, is, is there a, is gas an example of where the institutions which the bank follows um, might have got it wrong over the last decade? Thanks very much. Thank you. We have two additional questions here in the third row. Thank you. Yeah, if, if I might build on your suggestion that we would have a bit more on these negative emissions, and I, I may not know enough, but it's my feeling that in many of the national plans, the additional uptake of CO2 in soil, and to some extent also in vegetation where the trees grow further north or further up the mountains, if you have that, that, that this is being counted to the benefit of the country where it takes place as a negative emission. 
and it will be easier for a country in that case to meet a certain uh, non-ETS target. Now, I have started to wonder what is actually the difference between that uptake of CO2 in soil and in plants. I'm not talking about deliberately planted trees, but, but the type of uptake for which there's no active human uh, activity going on, what is the difference between the upt uptake in soil and, and plants from the uptake in sea? My country, Denmark, has a huge sea area around, and if uh, Poland and Russia and other countries, the huge areas should be allowed to count their, the uptake of their soils as a negative contribution on their emissions. Why shouldn't countries like Greece and Denmark with a lot of sea be allowed to count equivalently on, on the sea uptake in the sea, which is also just the result of higher CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. Now, now let me just express, I'm not suggesting this as a good policy, but I'm just asking, is there a lack of logic in, in this particular point? I would like to, Nick Baylinger, a clean tech anyone. I would like to get back to the issue of carbon pricing again. Um, I would wonder if I could have panels from whoever, uh, for, uh, uh, answers from whoever um, may want to uh, on, on CO2 prices in, in uh, the union. Um, we have heard from Sweden this morning that uh, Sweden has a, a carbon tax um, that works and um, ETS price levels obviously don't work if we want to be ambitious and if we want to plan long term. It would make a lot of projects a lot more financeable um, to bring up consensus point if we would have a price that would correspond to Paris targets. So where do you see this going um, in terms of floor price but also in terms of models other than a cap and trade system and also in terms of you know trying to export what we have done in Europe to other countries and continents where they are much less advanced, if that is the right strategy in terms of long-term planning or whether there the World Bank and others have, would have to you know, embark on a strategy that is different, meaning maybe a tax and not a cap and trade system. Thank you. No time for me to reflect like Mark has. <laughs> no. Uh, the, uh, I, I think you, you look at an area where yeah, um, you really need to, to meet multiple uh, objectives uh, because uh, you didn't raise the issue of energy security, the issue of energy uh, affordability, uh, etc. Uh, so uh, that are also elements that need to be taken into account uh, where there are, uh, like I said, a number of different elements uh, to be considered, trade-offs. Uh, and whether there is room, you know, for, you know, looking again at the new data and the models you raised the question also this morning, uh, I guess, yes. Thank you. A couple of quick points on cities and negative emissions. On cities, just to say, cities are investors too. Sometimes investors in the classical sense, you know, they have capital to spend, to invest, but also in general, they with their policy, they invest in the future of their, uh, of their people, you see. So for them, the function of long-term signal, direction of travel, long-term objective, is just as important as for private investors. So secondly, I think in Europe, we do have a, an attitude to involving local authorities. We have a number of uh, federal member states, even those who are not federal have you know, various forms of involvement of the, the local communities. I don't see why climate should be any different. I mean, that's the way we do policy in Europe. So they have to be part of the picture. Now, what I find interesting is to see the same developing in countries who do not have a similar tradition. Others do, you know, plenty of other countries have the same tradition as we, as we have, but some don't. And you see in those countries developing uh, interest of, uh, of cities and local communities and I find that extremely interesting and something that we should do our best to, to, to encourage. On negative emission, the fact is that we're not talking about absolute emissions here. We're talking about changes up and down. And those changes are all or virtually all man-made. That's, that's the logic of not counting, not counting seed. And even in agriculture, sorry, our land does not look, our seed looks pretty much the same as it did thousands of years ago if you don't look too closely at what's in it. Um, 
But our land, it's very different. And we've been changing our land dramatically in the past few decades. If you just think of um, deforestation and afforestation in the past 50 years in Europe, it's gone all over the place, up and down. Um, and negative emission, I didn't answer your, only indirectly your, your original question, but I was trying to when I mentioned the land, the land sector to be comprehensive. Uh, as I think I believe it was Thomas who said, you know, em some emissions are there to stay. But for a start, some emissions from agriculture are there to stay. Um, are we going to completely decarbonize our energy and our industry? I personally think we should seriously aim at that. But you know, to say now that we can is a bit too much. And then the question of negative emission becomes fundamental, even only, so to speak, for zero emissions. If we then have a peak into post-2050, what we do, then you know the, the, the argument becomes becomes even stronger. But the impression I have, and there I, I confess a relative ignorance hampers me, but the impression I have is that. That's an area where one would hear a lot a few years ago, and the one hears very little about today, too little. And it's something we need to have a really hard look at. Uh, we will try to sow the seed for that uh, in the long-term strategy, but that will only be the, the, the kernel of, uh, I think, a lot of work needs to be done on, uh, on, on the question of uh, negative emission and the role of land in that. Yeah, just, just um, thank you for the questions. I, I think all are very, very insightful. Uh, well, just, just, just adding to the, the response Constance offered to you, Mark. I think that, uh, well, everybody has the right to make mistakes. We are only human beings and we are uh, surrounded uh, by uh, the living environment and all we merely understand is the probability that certain development will take place or not. Well, some our political choices proved to be incorrect and also Mauro referred to it in, in the beginning. So that's why we have continuous cycles of revisiting policies, revisiting solutions, revisiting uh, actions, scenarios, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is happening. We are just learning while doing. So I, I would say that making the mistakes is good because it means that we do something. Um, just, just additional comment to this issue: soils or or, or an oceans. Sorry? Well, <laughs> that's, that's the necessary cost of being a civilization. Uh, well, the problem with the sinks in the ocean is that the CO2, when it comes to water, firstly acidifies oceans, which is part of the problem. Secondly, it is carrying the thermal energy, which makes the oceans get warmer and to expand its outer layer. So the sea level rises and also the winds, the hurricanes get more power when it, the, the, the air flows over the heated water. It's part of the problem. With soil, it's part of the solution because if we capture this carbon, it stays in the soil, makes it more fertile, makes it better. So it helps to reduce, well, the, 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 the use of artificial fertilizer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it is indirect mitigation measures. So, so I I would say it's incomparable and there is a lot of human additional effort that needs to be invested to make this soil better 
uh, there's a lot of human effort to be invested to make the forest more biodiverse and having higher capacity to absorb. So it's that includes uh, all the maintenance or the sustainable management that includes adding additional species that are more potent, like beaches, for instance, that, that, that can absorb more. Uh, so this is, this is um, probably the last minute now to start serious research in the EU how to include the things in our entire accounting system. We know how to measure reductions. It's almost very accurate. In general, it's accurate enough to be part of the trading scheme with markets being engaged. But we have difficulty with accounting of what is captured and stored in biosystems. And this is probably part of the uh, list of the necessary actions that should appear in the Commission's proposal. Thank you. So just to pick up on, on three points, on, on cities, so just a couple of examples, Paris and New York have both produced 1.5 degree plants. These are cities that don't have, a, by the way, a lot of land use to count on to actually reduce their emissions. They're also showing signs that they are influential investors. We heard from Paris that they had to take a decision on their gas and electricity network and had to impose on the suppliers that those should be completely carbon free by 2050. And this new type of uh, contract, which is a 30 year contract is becoming the new norm for the rest of France. So very influential small moves that make a difference. I also encourage you to look at the uh, declaration of the Carbon Neutrality Coalition, which has a, at the bottom an indication of the cities who are now doing their long-term strategies towards uh, net zero. Uh, maybe on the point on making mistakes and the banks and so on, I think what I would like to hear is how the banks from now on, when the long-term strategy is produced and agreed, how that becomes then your guidance for what is acceptable is no longer acceptable to, to invest in. I hope that those things will, will communicate and, and, and be coherent, but I'm sure they will be. No one picked up on the CO2 price. I think everybody probably here agrees here that the CO2 price is too low. Everybody should remember that the ETS was put in place to keep the cost low, so to keep the price of getting to a given target as low as possible. So let's keep that in mind. And I think if we were to project from various models and the IPCC report will give us plenty of that, the carbon price that it takes to take to go to 1.5 or whatever. The work by OECD and others shows that there's so much policy misalignments in our system that the price probably has to be much lower than that if we only reform all the cogs in the system to gear people towards low carbon action. One example, markets for electricity are highly inadequate to, pen to allow penetration of uh, the capital intensive technologies. We know that the price of CO2 to get there if we didn't have the subsidies would be horrendously high and much higher than the social cost that we have to incur now to get those renewables in the system. So let's think about the policy reforms to make sure that whatever price is there actually gets to decisions and is not lost in, in, the, in the noise. Thank you. We have our last, I think we'll be able to take, um, I see, oh, now we already have three questions. If you promise to keep them very short, uh, we'll try to take them all. And um, yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Freya Windel. I come from DGE Paris of the Parliament. So I have a question because we're speaking about negative um, emission technologies needs. I was just wondering um, in how far you may have considered geoengineering. I apologize if you spoke about this this morning. I missed the first two sessions. But geoengineering also encompasses um, BECs. Uh, so this is uh, connected to the land use, but um, CDR, um, CDS in general, and then um, also particularly in the view of India and China now making major, major investments on government level for solar radiation management because, so as it said, one thinks uh, that this is a quick option to mitigate. 
uh, Hypovovsky, or CST. I have a question uh, about the, the role of finance in sustainable transition, especially uh, coming back to the bad decisions that were perhaps made. Um, how do we avoid uh, financing these bad decisions now that we still have various, the European institutions have various targets that are not necessarily aligned with, uh, with climate policies, such as, let's say, connectivity and building new roads or uh, for example, security of supply for energy, and uh, how how do we avoid? How can finance play a role in aligning these, uh, let's say, contradicting goals of European institutions? So, just one question. I think um, it's. I like the idea of Europe leading by example, but just out of curiosity, it's. Considering there are a lot of uh, conversations around competitiveness in industry as well as on agriculture, does it? Uh, what would be an ideal time to actually engage the emerging economies? Because a lot of them are in the same conversation around long-term strategies, and it might be a good idea to actually lead with collaboration instead of examples. Because at the end of the day, it then again sort of creates a lot more confusion. So, what would be an ideal time? for the EU at large to engage with the emerging economies on the issue of long-term planning. Thank you. And can you introduce yourself? Please? I'm Siddharth. I work with Trisha on the 2050 Pathways platform. Very good. We have, now it's starting to be tricky. Um, so yes, Lionel, final question here. Thank you. Um, to uh, Mauro, one question through the uh, EU strategy. Um, the public consultation will start in June and I think the, the Time schedule till November will be uh, quite challenging. Are you going, is it possible uh, somehow to involve or to incorporate the, uh, the input from this consultation in your strategy building or even in your modeling you're doing, I, I suppose? Thank you. Sorry. For the sake of time, we'll have to wrap up. Um, so um, I would, we have a number of questions, um, but just um, as a message from all of you um, as we've been talking about the long-term strategies today um, I would like to hear from each of the panelists also your one key message for member states uh, for the EU institutions what should be considered when long-term strategies are being planned um, Constance would you like to start first ladies first as they say yeah let me just first come back, you know, on the on the question that was uh, raised as to how to uh, uh, align the, the bank's uh, financing activities with uh, climate policy objectives. I think one of the very important uh, elements is to is to ensure mainstreaming of climate considerations in uh, in everything that we uh, that we do. So uh, that means that we regularly need to look at our uh, sector lending uh, guidelines or criteria. There's one uh, coming up uh, this, uh, this year, uh, which is the one on uh, energy uh, lending, a very important one. I'm sure that we will have internal discussions. What is the best moment you know, to do this? Should we await uh, some material from the commission in November or you know, can we start this process uh, already uh, now? Um, in that sense, you know, we've looked at uh, also sustainable uh, transport uh, guidelines. Just one comment, uh, because on the one hand, we talk a lot about uh, mobility, the importance of electric vehicles, but those vehicles need to drive somewhere. So in that sense, uh, you know, some of the, the motorways uh, and the connectivity that is required to deliver on some of these other objectives like jobs and growth. Uh, you know, will will remain you know part of the yeah, the, the decision mix, and of course we will uh, also take that uh, you know into account when we look at uh, at, at newer uh, sectors or where we're going deeper, like you know on urban uh, development or uh, or tourism. My thought uh, for how to uh, um, uh, well, I, I think that uh, we heard a lot about uh, planetary yeah, boundaries. Uh, we also heard this morning about the importance of changing uh, behaviors. I think we really have to work very hard on also identifying that self-interest uh, that we, you know, uh, that we have uh, to to deliver uh, in, uh, in in this area. So um, aim aim high and deliver on the ground. I would say. 
So two words on the uh, on last words. Um, I think we would push strongly for ambition on long-term strategies and working through backcasting and not incrementally from where we are. And also we should aim for as much robustness and as visionary a process as possible, which to us means a very inclusive process uh, across society, but also across different parts of governments to get to the policy coherence issue that was raised just now. There is an example, New Zealand, which is now has put in place a systematic climate change impact assessment for all new laws or new bills coming to the, to the parliament, which is one way to say no new policies that are going to stand in the way of this goal. They have to fully reflect on on the climate change objective, and I think that's a, a good example to follow. Uh, well, I, I think that the EU is doing something similar since, I don't know, 20 years ago, probably. We have this strategic impact, environmental impact assessment, so every new strategy, every new law has to undergo this kind of test. So it's probably even wider than, than, than just concentrating on climate. And let me just recall what Maura said uh, in the beginning of his intervention, that only those policies are legitimate if they take, uh, which take into account jobs, which take into account development, competitiveness. And we have to see us not as the lonely planet, but as part of the bigger picture. We have our business partners, we have our political competitors, we have, well, our neighbors, for some of them, we look attractive, for some of them not. But we are not the lonely planet. And the EU has to find the right way to continue its development, to continue making life of Europeans better in a sustainable way. And that is the, the only message that we can convey to the world, that we know how to develop without making too much harm to the environment. Thank you. Very quickly on the um, international cooperation, we are collaborating with the emerging economies. That isn't the point. They are serious about these policies. The fact is that even in Europe, we will not have the climate policies we need if we don't marry them to economic development. It will not happen. And in developing countries, it will happen even less. If you create a situation where governments and voters have a choice, they won't choose to sacrifice prosperity uh, to fixing climate change. But the fundamental thing is that we don't need to make that a choice. We don't have to. We can address climate change by changing our economies. If you just take energy, I spend the rest of my career in trade policy. I cannot conceive a world where the union has a large trade surplus because we no longer have to pay for the energy bill. Even just that small thing, and it's a small thing, would dramatically change uh, the outlook for the European economy. So, you know, it's, my point is not that we should do example rather than cooperation, is that cooperation will work for individual items as we are now cooperating with China on, on the new ETS system. But at the end of the day, our emerging economies need to know that a transformation of the economy that fixes the climate problem works. And we are the only ones who at the moment have the popular mandate to do that, because our governments do have that mandate. Um, can we do it? That's, that's our job. Now, also on messages, well, um, well, sorry, on the timetable, yes, challenging. So what's new with that? Uh, but bear in mind one thing, this is not a legislative proposal where the commission presents a product that then needs to be changed, approved. This is a policy proposal with a very long-term perspective. It's going to be easily, between now and the final result, uh, two years' time for debate. So 
will take all the input we get in the next three months, be plenty of occasion to change even radically the strategy uh, if, we, if we get it wrong. As for last message, minus the Lonely Planet bit, I think Thomas stole my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you very much uh, for this final session and for your input. I think there's something that I, I took um, home with me, and I think this, when we started with the poll, um, it was the most popular name for the long-term strategies was decarbonization pathways. But on the basis of the discussion today, I would suggest that perhaps one of the terms that should have been included in there and could be a way to go forward is actually what, if we would be talking about the new growth strategy, new economic strategy, new industrial strategy. In the end, it's, uh, this is what we're talking about. So this a whole, It's a transition strategy. We're talking about a whole economy approach where we're trying to achieve our climate goals. So um, something to perhaps think about. Um, we have Imke, uh, who will be making uh, concluding remarks on the basis of the discussion today. Um, and uh, we would just like to thank on my behalf and on behalf of the panel. So thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, don't, don't be scared. I won't take much more of your time. Thanks for staying with us the whole day. So it will be very brief. I just want to remind you from where we started this morning, and I think we spent an exciting day actually together with sharing a lot of interesting thoughts. So we started off with the maximizer results, and then if reflecting about the role of long-term strategies and actually what they would be require to be good strategies. We had examples from member states, and we had an exchange now about what this means for the European Union for the broader discussion in terms of uh, the future of Europe and uh, also in the international context. I felt there are a couple of key ingredients actually which I uh, want to highlight as takeaway from the discussions today, which I think there was amazing support that long-term strategies are key for the success uh, and for the implementation of the Paris Agreement. I haven't heard any contribution which has quest questioned that. This is great and this is important. Um, it's a key tool uh, for us. As it stands, I think it's clear we need to go on with planning. Remember, we only have 13 countries so far having a long-term strategy based on the maximizer results. <laughs> So planning still, um, but also we need to go on, need to move on with uh, implementation. For that, the key ingredients I want to highlight are sharing experience, best practice. Sharing is key. It helps us to learn, and learning seems to be the the challenge of the future. So putting all of us in a learning mode. Also, we know already a lot and we think we know a lot, but given the challenge that has been set out in a very illustrative way, it seems we need to learn more and we need to move. We need to take different perspectives and we need to challenge ourselves to learn. So an ability to learn, what does it mean for institutions? I think that's a question which also comes and for organizations and for the multi level governance system uh, which we are operating in. Um, another key ingredient is to engage with other communities, with people, with sectors, um, with companies, with, with many different stakeholders, and to make sure that these people get ownership and feel they can contribute, but also what they contribute lends somewhere. So because we are all aware you can do that once, you can't do it many times, and uh, you need to be careful with this capital. So just new words we, and new areas we, we, we are sure we need to look into for good long-term strategies. This is industrial decarbonization, sorry, land use, circularity, and behavior change. Just this is so necessary, so we overcome the ambivalence which has been raised between where we want to be, and I think that has been a clear call. We want to try to reach 1.5 goal, 
So what does it mean for tomorrow, for now, for the next hours? What does it mean for how we act? And I think there is the gap which we need to close and behavior change is at the core of that. We are all looking forward to see the ideas from the commission. And I think everybody in the room feels like would like to contribute and we are looking forward to have the opportunity with the consultation and any other opportunity the commission is giving to open up and to able, enable this dialogue related to modeling to the debate the broader debate about the future of Europe and the mid-century strategy um, that leaves me oh, as a last thing to thank you for your patience for staying in the room for excellent speakers, and I know many of you spend time traveling to this event. Very, we are very grateful for all your contributions, and thank you on behalf of the Maximizer team and the EPC.